We are all set up waiting for the crowd to come in to enjoy the benefits of the old flyers group. Now, we're told that I'm Stephanie and um, Robin's got eye health issues, so I'm going to be talking, speaking today. It's Robin's story, it's Robin's history, and it's Robin's memories. I am merely the narrator, so therefore it's going to be in first person. The Key Biscayne will be, the, will be the main topic of the conversation. The talk is in two parts. The first part, we're just going to be looking at a few of the rescues um, and led up to the Key Biscayne. Then we'll have the break, and then the, after, the second part will be totally nothing about the Key Biscayne. For those of you who may not have known, the, um, at that stage, Okanagan helicopters were operating in Australia and they had the contract for the service in the Key Biscayne. Um, the Key Biscayne rig, I'll talk more about later, um, but the um, Canadian firm, as I said, Okanagan were the ones that um, were operating it. So I hope you're going to, we hope you're going to enjoy it and uh, we'll just start. As you can see, um, all the talk has been got from official data and I have a list of references at the end of the talk. A few definitions, just to get us started. The Carnarvon floods, which is the one we'll start off with, um, in my experience, evacu in my experience, evacuations bring their own unique challenges, as I'm sure most of you here are aware. In flood situations, the big advantage is that usually um, communications are usually operable and we, Rob was involved in the Carnarvon floods in 1980. He evac evacuated as per his logbook. One could say one stage you might have felt like a um, Noah in his ark but remember the pilots cleaned their own helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> Catabacks, so cyclones um, have their own problems and the problems with cyclones is they usually bring widespread damage to communications. Um, we picked up a man um, in the bush. He was severely dehydrated and he was walking oblivious to his surroundings. We turned, we turned him around and walked him back into the helicopter and he just sat down there. When we took him to the hospital, he were told that he wouldn't have lasted much longer in his current state. So he was fortunate. Next, we were sent to pick up a man who was reportedly sitting on the roof of his house. So we landed, um, nobody, no, nobody sitting on the roof of the house. Within a few minutes, um, a very irate man, clad in um, a hat and Wellington boots, came storming out and was not very keen on what we were doing and asked us what on earth we were making so much noise and why we landed because there was nothing wrong with him. Um, the language I'm using is a lot nicer than what he used to us. Um, so we left. Hey. Casabacks are what they are, casualty evacuations. I was sent to a place in Uganda where I was told to, I had to um, evacuate a police personnel. The police personnel turned out to be a police dog. Probably one of the most grateful evacuees I've ever worked with. He licked my hand profusely. As all first responders know, not all rescues had a positive outcome. I was sent to a fishing boat in distress that required me to lower a pump or pipe and extra fuel on a rope. I took spares in case something went wrong with the initial drop. 55 kilometre an hour winds and 60 foot seas, it was just too rough to have to winch down a crewman. The wind was so strong, the first attempt landed in the sea. Alas, so did the second. There was no time to return to Strawn for new equipment, so I hovered around until there was no light and I had to return to base. As we waved goodbye, I knew they were in for a rough night. The outcome was only one man managed to be washed up ashore and the other two perished. Now for a change, let's have a look at the helicopters that Okanagan had at the time. 
the S61N, which was the one that we had, we were operating, um, had several advantages. Um, it took 20, 28 passengers or 2,948 kilometres of payload. We regularly practiced water landings where possible and Mill Stream in the Pilbara was ideal for that. That's, a, as you can see, a personal photograph. The F-61 was used, was used in time for canals and floods. Um, it was handy um, at that time, but it would have struggled in the Key Biscayne rescue um, simply because of the prevailing conditions and the size of the helipad. The East Carnarvon picture on the right is a personal one when we're looking for people to, lo to evacuate people and as it turned out, animals as well. We eventually found some wing. Another helicopter we had at the time was the S66, S76. Um, the S76 began in the mid 1970s as an S74. With the design goal of providing a medium helicopter for portrait for corporate transportation and oil drilling industry. It was actually the first Sikorsky helicopter designed purely for commercial rather than for military purposes. Two pilots, or a pilot and a passenger, um, were, could be accommodated side by side um, and further 12 passengers in three rows of four. <coughs> you may, may remember the S-76 was the first helicopter to circumnavigate the world in an east to west direction piloted by the Australian Dick Smith in 1995. Unfortunately, if these things happened, the demand for the 76 waned during the uh, 2010s. Newer helicopters, such as the Augusta Westland, proved to be stiffer competition. March tw 2022, Sikorsky halted new orders. But they do say in that particular article that if anybody would like to go into partnership with them, they're happy to sort of re reorganise it again. So if anyone's got a lot of money in deep pockets, you've got an opportunity for investment. Now, let's talk and look at the Key Biscayne. That's the Key Biscayne in happier days with the legs jacked down and the hull out of the water. Visible are the four cranes, the drilling rig and the accommodation block and the helipad. In my opinion, this was an interesting rescue. You can trace the sequence of events, which in themselves weren't significant, but overall contributed to the loss of the rig. The official report offers a, word, a story worth reading when you wade through the preamble, but we hope that you'll find the talk story interesting. The next four slides give you a background details about the rig and the support details. In my opinion, this was noticed to me and noticed to us in Darwin that we felt the, um, there wasn't enough sag in the rope. The rope was too short. And we noted we thought there was a risk of tightening and of breaking. The red dot indicates the resting, final resting place of the Key Biscayne. Now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of actually what happened with the Key Biscayne. By some quirk of fate, it's 39 years today since I um, evacuated a crewman from the rig. Um, he had cuts and bruises having fell, fell down the water, the um, front um, leg well. I was instructed to stay at the hospital because, and re well, after he was patched up, 
and take him back to the rig because they did not want to um, have a day lost through injury. So that was what happened. You can see now, on by watching the screen, you can see how this disaster started to unfold. And I still believe it started off in Darwin with having a rope short, tow rope too short, but that was my personal opinion. During the, this period, a number of the crew, the rig crew, working on the decks were washed down um, one of the forward leg openings of the large, um, when a large sea came and um, carried away the railings. The men were using safety lines and safety jackets. Um, they were recovered, um, and apart from having a few cuts and bruises, they didn't have, there wasn't deemed to be a significant injury. However, um, because of the towing problem at the moment, they decided to add a 30, extra 30 metres of wire pennant was added to the rig's towing equipment. You can see there how things are just being um, going not in a good way. Pan Pan, as most of you know, is the international urgency signal that is used as a preface to a VFH transmission when this, the safety of a person or of a boat is in serious jeopardy, but not in, in a life-threatening situation. A pan-pan cannon usually does um, escalate to a mayday situation. And you can see quite he clearly this happened within half an hour. We um, left from Jandicott um, and were called in, and as were the two RAAA helicopters from Pierce, from Pierce Base. We hovered around, on arrival, we hovered around and we had observed the situation from all angles. We wanted to see what it was like, first of all, before we started doing anything. We also, as a three-person crew, we worked together and we made joint decisions, and we decided it was too dangerous for us to winch the men up. The RAAF pilots are very experienced in winching. However, they have little or no experience in landing on heli decks, especially in bad weather, um, but that was our bread and butter. This is where, together, with different skills, we combine together to secure the best possible outcome. So they were good at winching, we had experience in winching, they were good at winching, we were good at landing on heli decks in bad weather. When we looked around at it, and you'll hear this more in the video, we estimated that there was about 10 seconds that we could land on to evacuate people. So we could only evacuate 10 people. When we were on the heli, on the heli deck, we had to actually actively fly on the heli deck, otherwise we would have been thrown, thrown off. So we landed and we flew to stay on the heli deck. We also instructed, and the men were quite clear, they quite clearly understood, that if they couldn't come out within 10 seconds on their, on their bellies into the helicopter and we were about to take off, anybody would, who hadn't made it would be kicked off back onto the heli, heli deck and would have to wait for the next trip. That was clearly understood. That's um, the Lady Sonia, um, and they, you mentioned in the video as well, um, that they um, tried to put a life raft across from the Lady Sonia to the rig, but it smashed against the side. For most of you who do, most of you who, who know, I'll just go back to this other slide, um, most of you know um, that when you land on a heli deck, you watch the swell, and you land at the top of the wave where there's a brief pause before the rig goes down again. It's a simple manoeuvre when you have the knack. Um, and just so you land just before the, the, the rig comes coming up. It's a risky, but you can do it. Um, I only mention this because some weeks earlier I had been out to the heli, and I was landing on the heli deck and a swell came, so I was expecting to go down on the heli deck, and for the rig went down, and I went down, so it's still hovering over the top of it, and down and down. I saw some water at the side, and I thought to myself, this is not a good place for a young bloke like me to be at this particular time. So I took off, I was about to take off when I felt the heli deck touch the wheels of the helicopter. So to say that I was relieved, 
is an understatement. So that's why I mention that. And that's why I also mentioned to the fact that we had to fly actively. Now this photograph, I'm aware that it's rather blurred, however what I want you to see is that the men there on their hands and knees, these photographs by Curtis the RAAF who took the photographs from a level of a thousand feet above. Um, and I decided to use it anyway because it gives you the only opportunity I've got to show you what it was like for the men to have to scramble out with this rig going rolling on their hands and knees and knowing if they didn't get there in 10 seconds they'd be kicked off and they'd have to wait for the next trip. This photograph shows you that we were actually having to, we were flying there. You can see the rig is starting to tilt over and if we hadn't have actually flown it, we would have just ended up in the sea. That one is, a that's a photograph. And the reason I wanted to look at that is you can look at the difference in the water level. That was when we arrived, that was when we were leaving. And you can tell the difference in the water level. The picture on the left, the rig's about to roll. Um, and as I said, it, it was really quite um, difficult. And I think probably extraordinary nerve wracking for the people on the rig. That's us taking the last um, nine men to Lancelin. That was our last, our last trip. Whoops. We're just going to show you a video. Now, within this video, there is some, there's some information which is not quite correct. 110 kilometres an hour. This was part of the conversation between rescue coordinators. For all personnel to abandon the rig. Oh, Romeo, so at the moment, you are just uh, um, just taking off the non-essential personnel. Is that correct? You will have left 12 people on, left on board uh, when the uh, initial uh, rescue operation finishes. Is that correct? As we flew over the rig this morning, she was pitching wildly, making the job of getting help to the 52 men on board treacherous. Two Iroquois helicopters from RAAF Pierce and a privately owned Sikorsky began winching men off the chopper platform about 10 a.m., ferrying them to the tiny fishing settlement of Lancelin, about 30 miles away. Looks as though there are people on that platform now as the helicopter attempts to... There we go, there goes a... They winch one man off. It's being hauled up into the belly of the helicopter. We can just see... Just see him going. He's just below the helicopter now. With the two towboats standing by but unable to get close because of the huge seas, an RAAF caribou also took off from Pierce to drop rafts if necessary. This is how Robbie Anderson, skipper of one of the towboats, Lady Sonia, described the operation by ship to shore telephone. Yeah, they've taken all the uh, non essential personnel from the rig and uh, just left the towing crew on board. Uh, they've been transferred ashore. Huh? How many towing crew are there on board still then? Over? Uh, at this stage, uh, nine. Is anybody in any immediate danger on the rig? No, at this stage, no. It's believed there was initially some confusion between the men on the rig and their intending rescuers. A raft inflated on board the Lady Sonia and sent across to the rig by rocket line smashed itself to pieces against the ship's sides, while the rig crew, unwilling to attempt a waterborne rescue, lined up on the chopper deck to await help from RAAF aircraft. Information is still sketchy, but it's thought that nine men are still on board and desperate attempts are being made to halt the drift towards the coast. But if that fails, the big seas could smash the drilling rig to pieces on the notorious reefs which guard the shore. And as we flew over the pitching platform later this afternoon, the situation had passed beyond the critical. Attempts were being made to secure a second tow line and an anchor was down, but the rig was still drifting shorewards and was within five nautical miles of the reefs and shoals that have claimed so many ships over the years. Finally, the decision was made. The rig would be abandoned and the remaining 10 men would have to get off as best they could, at worst by jumping into the heaving sea to be picked up by the waiting tugs. Helicopters could no longer get close to the landing platform. They had already ferried 42 non-essential crew ashore to Ledge Point and Lancelin. These men were happy and dry, and with their heaving hearts calmed by a few ales, they were taken back to Perth by bus. With the rig glistening at times to more than 45 degrees, their big fear was that it would capsize.
I suppose everybody in their own mind thought that it would go over sooner or later. What do you do when you're in a position like that? Does everybody gather up on top or do they uh, stay in the rec room and worry or what? No, they just mustered us all up in the rec room and we just sat there and made jokes, just trying to keep the morale up. It was no good worrying about them. I mean, it was going to do us no good in the long run. The survivors have all been lavish in their prayers of the chopper rescue crews. The small seaside resort to provide food and drink for the rig workers. And although the men showed more interest in a supply of stubbies from the local tavern, most were shaken by their ordeal. Well, all the waves were breaking over the back. What happened was a lot of us guys went to uh, dinner, and there's a few guys down there looking after bilge pumps and everything. And they come out. By the time we come back out to, to work again, it was just chaos, you know, total chaos. You know what happened? Well, we got a bucket brigade going, everything was bad, pumps were breaking down. Yeah, uh, water was coming in left, right and centre, we just couldn't keep up with the flow of the water. The men said conditions at sea have been rough for the past few days and there have been a number of injuries. But it was about half past five this morning when the situation became extremely dangerous. Cleaner life, Phil Gerard was asleep when the drama started. Um, we just started work as usual and then um, things started to get bad, we were told to... Um, prepare for, they'll stop work completely, put on life jackets and wait for the, um, for the people at the top to decide what to do. How smooth it was the rescue operation? Oh, it was very good. It was, well, once the choppers started coming out, they, they did a great job. Great job. How quickly were, were the men off the uh, rig? Once it started, relatively quickly, but um, when the first choppers arrived, they had to assess the situation and one thing and another, but once it started, great job, they did a really great job. The men were transported to Perth by bus this afternoon, where they hope to rejoin the rig when it arrives off Fremantle. Howard Gretton reporting. Good evening everyone. News through from Canberra. The federal government has just ordered an immediate inquiry into today's drama off the West Australian coastline. Transport Minister Peter Morris has issued a statement saying the Transport Department in Western Australia will lead a full investigation under the Navigation Act. The latest from our news crew near the stricken Key Biscayne rig is that it's still drifting 12 kilometres offshore at a rate of one kilometre an hour towards Ledge Point. Coastal surveillance in Canberra has now ceased involvement in the drama except for monitoring the situation. The official time given for the rig to run into the coastline is 10 to 12 hours from now. But if the $52 million rig continues on its hapless course, treacherous reefs up to three kilometres offshore are expected to claim the giant explorer first. Two of the 52 men injured in mountainous seas were in fact injured while trying to scramble off. One has broken ribs, the other believed to have broken teeth and lacerations after they were swept back into rigging on board. The overall safety of the 51 men and their skipper can be directly attributed to superb flying by the pilots of the rescue helicopters both military and civilian. So that's the situation. Our news team is in constant touch up at Ledge Point. If there are any more developments tonight, we'll bring them to you here on 7. Four men to safety at a time. They were then ferried back to shore. Yeah, you might find, uh, if you sit here and watch it for a while, there's an occasional lull where it's uh, not rolling and pitching so badly. Uh, that's probably your best bet to try and uh, get onto the uh, actual pan. The situation was being watched in Canberra by the Coastal Surveillance Centre, which coordinated today's operation. At four o'clock, it was decided to abandon the attempt and airlift the skeleton crew to safety. We got everybody off our whole sand passengers, and we're now back for Lancelin. Okay, we got everybody off our whole sand passengers, and we're now back for Lancelin. And with those words, the last of 52 crewmen were winched to safety off the $50 million rig Key Biscayne. She'd been in trouble for two days, and this morning, tow lines snapped as she was pounded by 10 metre waves. Late today, with a lull in the storm, the rig was anchored off Lancelin. But we've just heard news that the rig tonight has broken free and is drifting dangerously close to reef. Right. Next morning, we flew out to have a look and see what had happened to the rig. We had, we had heard that it might have capsized about 6.35 the night before. We, we flew up the coast, just in case, a little bit up the coast, just to see if there was any wreckage. Um, we couldn't find anything. And to the best of my knowledge, there's no wreckage ever been found. So that was the sea that greeted us the next day. Many people every day demonstrate acts of bravery and never get recognised for it. Therefore, we were very surprised and humbled when the flying crew, both civilian and military, were awarded the Queen's, bravery, Queen's Medal for Bravery 
as well as the Royal Humane Society Bronze Medal for Bravery. Several members of the Key Biscayne crew were awarded bravery citations. The third pilot from Okanagan was not available for the presentation. Right, what happened to me? Now, that's the Key Biscayne today. Um, it's for experienced divers only. Um, the wreck is settled upside down with the jack-up legs collapsed towards the north of the platform. It's one of Perth's most spectacular dives and the, and the, the legs can, can house grey nose sharks and the bums of large fish, crayfish, can be seen throughout the twisted wreckage beneath the um, drilling platform. The wreck lays a maximum of 42 metres in the shallowest part of the, of the drilling platform start and ends at 26 metres. Although it has an anchor, it can move in stormy weather and therefore it's recommended that divers only do so in calm conditions. The rig does not present any danger to commercial fishing operating the area, but they all know about the site. Some of the um, diving companies, particularly um, Blue Destiny, who were kind enough to give me permission to use their photograph, have actually got some very nice videos of diving around the rig and the, um, fish, and the fish and the sharks that are making it their home. <laughs> Thank you very much for your attention, and um, that's Rob's story. Hey. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, and I think another round of applause for this amazing man to my right. Thank you, Rob, for agreeing to be part of this today. How many landings did you make on the rig, Rob? Um, Steph tells me four, but I can't, can't remember. Four. Four landings. Getting, a, getting um, a approximate 58 people off at 10 each, um, so with about four or five landings. How many were winched off the rig? Um, the, no, I don't know, and um, because the RAAF, um, I don't have their records, but we suspect there was probably about um, 12. As I said, they're very experienced in, in um, winching, but we decided it was too dangerous for us to winch. We were, had more experience in landing. Thank you. At the back, Brian Mole and our other helicopter pilot, the time of the rescue, do you know the water depth from? No. <laughs> Why didn't they lower the legs for stability? Well, everybody wants to know that question because as you would have seen early on in the, in the presentation, there was a comment made about the fact that it, the legs should have been lowered before it, before it went down. So why it didn't? Um, and for the same reason Rob's comment about enough um, sag in the rope, why that wasn't attended to in Darwin, that's a question I don't know. And if you look in the final report, that's actually not a question that's answered either. Uh, Rob, how many helicopter hours did you finish up with? Steph says ten and a half thousand. I don't know. I didn't count. <laughs> he doesn't go through his logbook. I'm the one that went through the logbook to make sure about everything. And I might also say that Rob holds, still to this day, the record in England for the most acreage covered by helicopter spraying. Rob also has made the comment that in spite of his use in Uganda, one of the most difficult and dangerous places to fly was crop dusting. He said that um, unfortunately farmers had this strange idea and they get out with their, their rifles and like to have a pop shot 
had people flying over doing spraying. So he said that was wasn't actually flying under the telephone lines was a major problem, although that was you could take that risk. But these farmers who would like to take pot shots at you were always a risk. Rob, Stephanie, uh, a great deal of thanks to you both for coming and presenting your story today. A unique story. I think, don't think any of us would have a, any inkling of the bravery needed to go out in those conditions and rescue those men. But they, they served people and they weren't thinking of their own safety. Thank you, Pat.